Bună seara! Bine ați venit și în seara asta la o nouă întâlnire Flux. Nu-mi place să fac ce să fac acum, dar vă rog să ridicați o mână sus cei care sunteți pentru prima dată împreună cu noi. Vrem să ne facem așa o idee despre câți oameni noi avem. Tot mai mulți. Mulțumesc, mulțumesc. Pentru voi care sunteți pentru prima dată împreună cu noi, seriile acestea, în seriile acestea vrem de fapt să cunoaștem mai multe despre lumea în care trăim și despre noi, să ne cunoaștem pe noi. Așadar, având în vedere fluxul continuu de informații care ne bombardează în fiecare zi, vrem să luăm câte o mică pauză și ne străduim să căutăm specialiștii și oamenii cei mai competenți să ne răspundă la aceste întrebări pe care le avem. Prin urmare, și în seara asta vrem să luăm o pauză de la cotidian și să încercăm să răspundem la aceste întrebări. Dacă pe parcursul prelegerii aveți întrebări pentru invitatul nostru, vă invităm să intrați pe sli.do sau căutați pe Google Slido și o să aveți afișat pe ecran uh, un cod cu care vă puteți înregistra și să trimiteți întrebări. Uh, împreună cu noi în seara asta este Denis Vasiliu, coordonator Fundația Agora Cristi, Centru de Studii Creștine și Apologetică și uh, o să o rog pe ea să vină pe scenă și să ne prezinte invitatul și subiectul din această seară. Denis. Bună seara! Mă bucur din toată inima să fim împreună cu dumneavoastră. Nu sunt singură, suntem toată familia noastră și câțiva voluntari. Vă rog să vă ridicați ca să. Câțiva... Îi numesc voluntari pentru că au fost voluntari la. Uh, conferința uh, C.S. Lewis and Kindred Spirits de săptămâna trecută și sunt așa de încântată că sunt și ei cu noi în seara aceasta și puteți să le urați bine bun venit. Nu e chiar așa ușor să ajungi de la Iași la Cluj, uh, dar e o distanță care în ultima vreme am tot străbătut-o și uh, ni se pare tot mai scurtă, ca să zic așa, și tot mai bună pentru noi. Ne bucurăm să fim aici în mijlocul dumneavoastră. Eu sunt Denis Vasiliu, predau la Universitatea Alexandru Ianguza din Iași. Am studiat teologie și literatură. M-am întâlnit cu C.S. Lewis pentru prima dată la 20 de ani, în 89. Eram foarte pasionată de citit și deși pe din afară nimeni n-ar fi spus că ar fi ceva în neregulă cu mine, pe dinăuntru Eram o tânără complet zdrobită și dezorientată la sfârșitul anilor de comunism. Și după 12 ani de educație ateistă, în care ni s-a spus că Dumnezeu nu există, am fost confruntată pentru prima dată cu întrebarea cine este Domnul Isus Hristos și dacă El a fost o persoană reală și dacă într-adevăr a fost Fiul lui Dumnezeu și așa mai departe. Și, bineînțeles, am început să citesc Biblia, mi se părea că absolut orice tânăr care se respectă, măcar o dată, trebuie să citească și această carte, care este The Masterpiece a Literaturii Universale. Dar, deși dezbăteam și încercam să înțeleg, la nivel rațional era foarte greu să accept că totuși Dumnezeu există. Și printr-o minune am primit o carte numită Creștinism redus la esențe, scrisă de C.S. Lewis, care fusese tradusă de Societatea Misionară Română din Witten, exact de acolo de unde este musafirul nostru Jerry Rudd. Și prin acea carte am primit toate răspunsurile pe care eu le aveam la nivel rațional și care... În consecință m-a condus, ca să zic așa, să accept că adevărul creștinismului este real și este cel care, pe care eu îl căutam de fapt. Ca să scurtez, atunci nu am înțeles absolut deloc cine este C.S. Lewis, nici nu prea m-a interesat, sincer, să vorbim. El a intrat, a fost adus în țară mai târziu de domnul Andrei Pleșu, 
când s-au întors de la studii din străinătate, au avut o listă de 10 autori pe care să-i promoveze, printre care mulți creștini, bineînțeles că aceiași erau interziști în România, și așa se face că C.S. Lewis este tradus în cea mai mare parte de către editura Humanitas și acolo găsiți aproape toate cărțile lui traduse în limba română. Pentru că mai târziu au apărut și filmele și pentru că eu am studiat teologie și engleză, am sfârșit prin a face un doctorat interdisciplinar pe C.S. Lewis în care am demonstrat că practic toate convingerile lui creștine demonstrate în cărțile de apologetic, măcar am încercat să demonstrez, nu neapărat, toate convingerile lui creștine argumentate în cărțile de apologetică sunt de fapt prezente și în cărțile de ficțiune și acesta este un subiect absolut extraordinar. Și pentru că în lume sunt multe societăți uh, uh, care uh, se ocupă de uh, operele lui Lucius Lewis și a celorlalți prieteni ai lui, grupul Inklings de la Oxford. Noi uh, am intrat în contact cu ei, am început să descoper această lume și uh, în uh, acum 8 ani am uh, organizat prima conferință Lucius Lewis în Universitatea din Iași și avem câteva imagini pentru ca să vedeți despre ce este vorba. Deci... Uh, Practic, odată cu apariția filmelor și cu faptul că au fost traduse cărțile, ni s-a părut absolut esențial ca noi să prezentăm acest autor și alți autori pe care îi numim acum Kindred Spirits, care au adevăruri atât de minunate pe care noi, de care noi avem nevoie și care pot veni cu răspunsuri la întrebările pe care noi le avem. Și a început, bineînțeles, cu doctoratul meu și cu o conferință care a avut loc în 2013, când s-au împlinit 50 de ani de la moartea lui C.S. Lewis. Vreau să vă spun că a fost un eveniment extraordinar, pentru că atunci când C.S. Lewis a murit, toată lumea a crezut că opera lui, faima lui, va muri odată cu el. Nimeni nu și-a imaginat că el va ajunge să fie cel mai influent uh, scriitor creștin al secolului 20. Și așa se face că uh, am avut la conferință și ambasadorii britanici în două ediții și a, cu ocazia asta vă prezint și Universitatea din Iași, pe care vă invit să o vedeți. Uh, cred că este foarte important. Foarte mulți specialiști din Oxford, Cambridge și de peste tot în lume au participat. Uh, eu, între timp, am adunat o colecție considerabilă de cărți, uh, care acum este o sursă de, uh, mă rog, uh, inspirație pentru colegii mei și, bineînțeles, este o conferință interdisciplinară prin faptul că noi putem stabili un dialog între literatură, teologie, liter filozofie, istorie și artă, în care dezbatem adevărul esențial ale vieții și întrebările fundamentale din toate punctele de vedere. De fiecare dată încercăm să avem și un eveniment de artă, pentru că este absolut foarte important să includem arta și, bineînțeles, am încercat să organizăm și în alte universități, cum ar fi la Cluj, nu, nu la Cluj, la București și la Brașov sau la Chișinău și sperăm în viitor ca una să fie și la Cluj. Așa cum vă spuneam, încercăm să avem evenimente culturale în care să implicăm personalități din lumea culturală și din ea și de peste tot din țară. Acolo ați văzut, este fiul lui Owen Barfield, în cazul în care sunteți familiar cu scriitorii Inklings. Toți, într-un fel, pe rând, au fost abordați de noi. Doamna Rodica Albu este prima care a tradus șifonier, leu și fonierul și vrăjitoarea în limba română, tot în 89 și ea este partea echipei pe care, care organizează conferințele și, după cum vedeți, personalități din toate catedrele care țin de științele umaniste au participat de-a lungul anilor. Acum trei ani am organizat și masa de Thanksgiving pentru că mulți din musafirii americane au fost cu noi și ei au pierdut ca și Jerry anul ăsta Thanksgiving acolo și doar câteva imagini ca să vedem că Practic, acum trei ani, la acest sfat al specialiștilor cei mai importanți care sunt, am hotărât să înființăm societatea, societatea C.S. Lewis și Kindred Spirits 
pentru Europa Centrală și de Est, care este unică uh, și um, încercăm să punem bazele acestei societăți pentru ca să promovăm uh, și traducerea, și scrierea, și studierea uh, autorilor creștini. Și acestea sunt câteva imagini de la conferința de anul trecut, de acum trei ani. Am făcut câteva interviuri la Oxford, printre care și uh, domnul Cali părintele Calistos Weir, care este capul Bisericii Ortodoxe din Anglia și uh, este absolut extraordinar că sunt specialiști din peste 30 de țări care au participat la diferitele evenimente pe care le-am avut. Inclusiv am început să traducem cărți sau să primim diferiți cercetători mai tineri care vin să susțină lucrări în cadrul conferinței. Acestea fiind spuse, în timp ce se mai derulează filmele și mă rog, ne apropiem de încheiere, vreau să vă spun cât de încântată sunt că împreună cu noi Uh, profesorul Jerry Ruth, care este pentru a doua oară la conferință, uh, este aici cu noi. Noi am avut conferința cea de-a cincea ediție săptămâna trecută la Iași. Va fi afișat un, uh, un link și pentru uh, aceia dintre dumneavoastră ca, care doriți să vedeți prelegeri de la conferință, puteți să intrați pe platforma pe care noi am pus-o, fiindcă am avut și live și online și puteți acolo să ascultați toate prelegerile. Vă așteptăm cu mare drag și să vedeți conferința și să deveniți membri ai societății CS lui St. Kindry Spirits și uh, uh, nu îmi rămâne decât să-l uh, invit pe profesorul Ruth uh, ca să ne țină tema pe care am propus-o uh, și uh, dumnealui este profesor de evanghelism la uh, facultatea uh, din Wheaton, Wheaton College, din, uh, de lângă Chicago, uh, Illinois și practic are câteva scris, uh, cărți scrise pe C.S. Lewis și este unul din cei mai uh, importanți uh, erudiți în scrierea lui C.S. Lewis și cred că o să vă bucurați uh, de ceea ce a pregătit pentru noi. It is very difficult to speak after seeing the dramatic portrayal in short period of time of the Tolkien Lewis legacy. But I'm grateful that I can be here with you this evening to talk about some elements of their story, how it began and what motivated both of these men and what they did to inspire one another to make a difference in our world today. But I, I must begin Lewis and Tolkien had several friends. They had a group called the Inklings. They would write and read their stories to one another. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But one of the Inklings was a man named Owen Barfield. And Owen Barfield wrote a book on C.S. Lewis. And in that book, he made this statement. The experience of oneself over against that which is not oneself is a sine qua non of human consciousness. Sine qua non is a Latin phrase that means without which there's nothing. Let me say it again. The experience of oneself over against that which is not oneself is basically the most important thing in human consciousness. If I am not engaged with something other than myself, I am likely to project myself on everything I see in the world. And that subjectivistic approach to life keeps me trapped in the dungeon of self. I need to understand myself in relationship. Um, I have a very close friend. His name is Mark Lewis. Mark Lewis is a professor where I am a professor. And he is the theater professor. And he was a man given to the arts. Even from childhood, he was the eighth born child in his family, and all of his family were more in a rigid, almost materialistic approach to life, and Mark loved the arts. When he was six years old, his parents were gone, and Mark wanted to show his parents he loved them with his artistic talent. So one of the older siblings was supposed to be watching him. Well, you know how that goes. Nobody was paying attention to him. 
He got out his Crayolas, he got out his pen, pencils, colored pencils, he got out his paints, and he spent the entire day drawing a mural up the white wall of their house. And he thought to myself, when dad and mom come home, they're going to know how much I love them because they're going to see this here. It didn't quite go the way he expected. When his parents came home, he was spanked and disciplined. And he said his sorrow was not that he was disciplined, but that his parents didn't see that he was trying to show them he loved them. Fast forward many years later, Mark was directing the autumn play at Wheaton College. And his days were, were very busy. He'd get up in the morning, help his wife with the children. He would get prepared for lectures for that day. He would grade papers. He would go to faculty meetings. He'd meet one-on-one -on -one with students. He'd come home for one hour for dinner and to collect himself before he'd go back into the evening for rehearsals that went long into the night. After about four weeks of this, he was very weary. And he came home, and while he's sitting, resting, before he has to go back to school, he sees his daughter, Ruby, she was six years old at the time, with a plastic basin in the sink, and the water was going crazy and splashing all over. And Mark realizes he's going to have to clean up this mess. He wanted rest. He said, Ruby, honey, what are you doing? Ruby burst into tears. And his wife said, Mark, she knew you were weary. She was just getting water so that she could wash your feet. Mark remembered his own six-year-old experience. And he said, oh, Ruby, honey, I am so sorry. He helped her with the basin. He said it was the coldest water he ever put his feet in in his life. And he said, you know, my parents didn't get it right. I got it half right. Maybe Ruby one day will get it all right. Why is that story so meaningful to us? Because we've all been the one on both sides of the story. We've been the one who was misunderstood, even though our intentions might have been good. And we've been the one who did the misunderstanding. And consequently, all of us long to be understood by somebody else and understood in a way that we can shape our self-identity by virtue of that. Um, there's a man named Donald Miller. He wrote a book called Blue Like Jazz. And in this one book that he wrote, he said, when he was in school, he was always on the fringe of the group at his school. He wanted to be popular. He wanted everybody to like him. But he was always on the fringe. One day he was at home and he read a poem and he liked the poem, so he committed it to memory. About two, three weeks later, somebody at school said to him, some comment. And Miller said, that reminds me of a poem. And he recited the poem. And all the other students said, Miller, you are smart. You are so smart. It said it was the first time he ever felt good about himself. Two things happened. Number one, he started memorizing more poetry after that. And number two, he realized he needed to gain a sense of himself based on how other people saw him. And we go back now to this quote by Owen Barfield. The experience of oneself over against that which is not oneself is a sine qua non of human consciousness. I, I think what we see in Lewis and Tolkien is a friendship that emerges where each of them were better because of the friendship and because of what each contributed to the relationship one to the other. It's, it's interesting, uh, Lewis writes about this in, in uh, his book, The Four Loves. And in this book, he talks about uh, eros, the love between the sexes. He talks about storge, familiar love, family love. He talks about agape, which is God's love for man. But he also talks about friendship. Philia is the word. And he writes this, in friendship, we think we have chosen our peers. In reality, a few years difference in the dates of our births, a few more miles between certain houses, the choice of one university instead of another, posting to a different regiments, the accident of a topic being raised or not raised at a first meeting. Any of these chances might have kept us apart. 
But for a Christian, there are, strictly speaking, Lewis writes, no chances. A secret master of the ceremonies has been at work. Christ, who said to his disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, can truly say to every group of Christian friends, you have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. The friendship is not a reward for our discrimination and good taste in finding one another out. It is the instrument by which God reveals to each the beauties of all the others. They are no greater than the beauties of a thousand other men. By friendship, God opens our eyes to them. They are like beauties derived from him, and then in a good friendship, increased by him through the friendship itself. So that it is his instrument for creating as well as for revealing. At this feast, it is he who has spread the board, and it is he who has chosen the guests. It is he we may dare to hope who sometimes does and always should preside. Let us not reckon without our host. Now, it's significant here that when Lewis and Tolkien became friends, they, they didn't have a whole lot in common as far as any kind of faith issue. Lewis was a, 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 Tolkien was a Christian, and Lewis was an atheist. And yet Lewis talks about this even further in his book, The Four Loves. He says you have different kinds of friends. He said the first kind of friend that we get is the friend who reads all the same books that we read and gets the same thing out of those books that we get out of those books. And basically, they tell us we're not crazy. Other people have seen things the way we see them. The second kind of friend is the person who reads all the same books that we read and gets something completely different out of them. They become sparring partners. They sharpen our intelligence. Without them, we would be dulled by comparison. And consequently, we learn to appreciate somebody of difference and grow through that experience. Uh, Lewis also talks about a community of friends. Um, in, in one of his books, The Experiment and Criticism, it's a, it's a literary critical book, he says, my own eyes are not enough for me. I would see what others have seen. I would read what they have written. Even that's not enough for me. I would read what they've imagined. Even that's not enough for me. I regret that the animals cannot write books. Gladly would I see how the world comes to the eye of a mouse or a bee, or how it comes charged to the olfactory sense of a dog. How many of you have dogs? I, I, I love my dogs. And, and, and in the morning, I get up before my wife. I make her a cup of coffee. I, I go up to the room, and, and, and her alarm clock every morning is me having a cup of coffee near her face and going like that so she can smell it and she wakes up. But before I take the coffee up, I take the dog out. I know what I need to do when I first get up. At my age, I have to visit the bathroom. When it's time for me to take my dog outside, I'm assuming he's like me. But what does my dog do? Maybe some of you that have dogs know exactly what I'm talking about. They go outside, and rather than finding a tree someplace, they stick their nose up in the air, and they start sniffing whatever's wafting through. And I go, what? Do they know that I don't know? There's a sense of wonder about this. When we encounter a friend or a group of friends that help expand our vision of the world and see things with greater clarity. And so it was with Tolkien and Lewis. You see, they both also found that there could be books that we have that become our friends. That we can benefit not only from those who are our peers in our own time, but we could read books from other times and we can grow in a wider understanding that is not just rooted in our culture, but could see even beyond our own culture. Lewis and Tolkien both had interests in the Nordic sagas, the Icelandic sagas. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I was asked to come with C.S. Lewis's son and me, and we went to Iceland to lecture on Lewis and Tolkien and the Icelandic sagas. Now, Tolkien, Lewis said, was a man inside of language. <clears throat> he would learn a language a year just to do it. He even signed a contract 
to do the translation of the book of Job, the book of Jonah, and some of the Psalms for the Jerusalem translation of the Bible. Tolkien signed the contract and had never learned Hebrew. So he had to learn Hebrew after he signed the contract. I had a Hebrew professor in graduate school who said he thought it was the best translation of Job in the English language. This guy's amazing. And Tolkien, during World War I, he was fighting and he experienced a mustard gas time. He had to go to the hospital. When he was in the hospital, what do you do? You didn't play video games then. There were no uh, uh, movies to watch. And he sat in a bed and he invented languages. And then he asked himself the question, what were the people like who spoke these languages? And what began to emerge out of his imagination was a whole world that if you've read The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or The Unfinished Tales or The Silmarillion, you know about that world. And it's attractive to you. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But there was a student at Oxford University. He had Lewis as a tutor, and he had Tolkien as a tutor. These two knew each other casually. They were on the same faculty, but they were at different colleges at Oxford. And this student knew that they both liked the Icelandic myths. So the student suggested that Lewis and Tolkien and a few other students get together to translate the myths from the old Icelandic. Lewis writes about it. He said, yeah, we would each struggle to translate just one sentence. And then Tolkien would go on for pages and pages. A man inside language. As a matter of fact, Lewis writes science fiction books. The main character in his three science fiction books, Out of the Silent Planet, Perlandra, That Hideous Strength, is a man named Ransom. He's a philologist, a student of languages. And Ransom's first name in Lewis's character is Elwyn Ransom. Elwyn means friend of the elves. So Lewis and Tolkien meet in this group to translate the sagas. They call themselves the coal biters. And it was kind of a, an image of people huddled together in cold north environments close to a fire, so close they could almost bite the coal. And they would tell their story. So Lewis and Tolkien and these students did the translation work. And a friendship can, began to emerge. Lewis says friends are different than lovers. Lovers, when they walk down the street, if you're walking behind them, they kind of go like this because they're looking at each other and they're not paying attention where they're going. But friends walk down the street, lickety split, just straight ahead because they've got a common interest and it's out of the pursuit of that common interest that they draw together. So Lewis and Tolkien started getting together over these stories. The students eventually graduated and pretty soon it was just Lewis and Tolkien in the room. And Tolkien mentioned to Lewis about these stories he started writing during World War I. He, he was a little bit embarrassed because the stories were so different than the kinds of stories we have today. And when Tolkien first came out with his form of fantasy, you didn't hardly see very many of these kinds of stories in bookstores. But now you go into bookstores in America and you will see aisles of these kinds of stories as people have copied the literary form. So Tolkien, a little bit embarrassed, a little shy, he says to Lewis, I've, I've been writing some things. I, I, I wonder if you'd be willing to look at them. And he became very vulnerable with Lewis. Uh, it's interesting that friendships have this dynamic, don't they? If you have learned to trust a person, if you want to go to the next level, you sometimes will reveal to them secrets about your soul. I don't know about you, but I fully believe the secrets we can't talk about control us. We need to have people that we trust. And to engage in that trust, you have to take risks initially. And so Tolkien shared with Lewis about these stories, and Lewis proved true. They had enough of a relationship. 
He was vulnerable. Lewis reads the stories, comes back and says, these are absolutely brilliant. Years later, Tolkien would say, the Lord of the Rings would have never been published had it not been for C.S. Lewis, who listened to him while he was writing them and so on. And Lewis also critiqued Tolkien. He didn't just say, oh, these are great, these are great. He says, this is inconsistent here. You might want to think about this. This needs to be somehow modified if you want people to really understand what you're writing. And Tolkien could hear him. And the reason why Tolkien could hear him was he knew that Lewis loved him. And he gained his understanding of himself based on how his friend saw him. But remember, Lewis was an atheist. And consequently, Tolkien, who was a Christian, then also started critiquing Lewis a little bit at this particular point. Uh, Lewis, Lewis was a man who, who, who had a sense of longing. He said when he grew up, uh, he lived in a house where there were books everywhere, but the books that his parents had were mostly books about uh, law. His father was a lawyer. Books about mathematics. His mother had a degree from the 1800s. She was one of the first ones in her region, a woman, to get a, a, a degree and in mathematics. But Lewis said, but my interest was in fairy stories and stories that talked about things that seemed transcendent over and far away and so on. And he said he didn't have any sense of beauty in his life. So as a matter of fact, absence of beauty characterized my whole childhood. He said, I've never been in a beautiful building, and I didn't think a building could be beautiful. It's interesting. I've, I've tried to go everywhere where Lewis went. I, I went to see all the places where he fought in World War I in France. I've been to his home in, in Ireland. As a matter of fact, the, the, the woman who owned his home years ago when I was giving lectures there invited me to spend two and a half hours just looking at all the nooks and crannies. From his bedroom window, he could watch them as they built the Titanic and the Belfast Locks. It's interesting. He would write in Surprised by Joy, his autobiography, about looking out the window and seeing particular hillside off in the distance. I was able to do that. It was fascinating to me. But he said, absence of beauty characterized his life. I went in that house. It was a stunningly beautiful house. What on earth was he talking about? You walked in the entrance, and the entrance was very large. It had a winding staircase that went up to the second floor. And over in this one side, there was a fireplace in the entry. That's how big the entry was. A fireplace big enough you could walk into it. It had tiles of cold wool malt blue, and it had bronze fixtures. And, and, and I'm looking at this, and I'm, I'm saying, as, me, as soon as I walk in, what a beautiful place. What did he mean? He had never seen a beautiful building. It had Mediterranean wood on the sides. And then it had this whole lift because the entry went up to the second floor where the staircase went, and it was all light up there. It was like walking into a cathedral where you have the dark windows down, the stained glass windows, and then you have the open windows, and your, your, your whole body goes like this when you walk in that kind of architecture. That's what the house was like. What did he mean it wasn't beautiful? He said, the first beauty I ever saw was when my brother Warren brought into his room a little toy garden he had made on the lid of a biscuit tin or a cookie tin. And he said, what all the real gardens failed to do for me, that garden did. And it awakened in him a longing, not for toy gardens, but for something almost transcendent. But Lewis and Tolkien both had an experience. Both of them were orphans. Now, Lewis had his father, but his father, he thought, didn't really understand him. But Lewis's mother died when he was nine years old. People in his church told him, oh, if you pray for her, she'll get better. I don't think you should give that kind of a guarantee to a child. But they said, pray for her, she'll get better. He prayed for her, she got worse. He was praying for her as if her survival depended upon his prayers. And she died. He says, if there's a God, I don't want anything to do with him. Why would he allow that? Tolkien, on the other hand, had been born in Bloemfontein, South Africa. His parents were English, 
but his father was a banker, and he went to South Africa to work in a bank. Tolkien said that uh, he and his mother and his younger brother, Hillary, came home for one summer to England after they'd been living in South Africa for a while. And they never went to South Africa because his father died while they were away. And it was just a couple years after that that Tolkien's mother died. And so when he's very young, he's lost both of his parents. And there was a Catholic priest, a Father Morgan, who took Tolkien in and basically raised him, but raised him as an orphan. Lewis and Tolkien had the common experience that brought them together also, that they had both had uh, sad childhoods. Well, anyway, Lewis, because of the sadness in his life, became an atheist. He said, I don't want anything to do with God. Tolkien, on the other hand, because of his sadness, drew closer to God. There's a difference there. And as they began to talk, they had a friendship where they were bound together by the common interest and story. But they had this difference in matters of faith. Now, Lewis had said he had never seen beauty before, but it awakened in him a, long, in, in him a longing. But as an atheist, how does he get over all these intellectual problems? If God's good and all-powerful, why does evil exist in the universe? That was a story that uh, concerned him. He, he didn't believe in God. He was a materialist to accommodate his atheism. And so consequently, how does he get past all of that stuff? And Tolkien and Lewis were going through life together, but Tolkien was a faithful Christian, and Lewis was an atheist. But nevertheless, both of them had this common interest and story. They loved the myth mythology, and in a, almost all the mythologies, the gods come down to human beings, and they have connection with those human beings. And Lewis loved the story. He was moved by it very deeply. And, and he would talk with Tolkien about it. And they both loved the stories, but Tolkien actually believed there was a story like this that was true. I, I think I could give you some examples. I remember when my children were young, well, we wouldn't let them watch television during the week, during school, school year, only on the weekends. But oftentimes we watched Disney movies. How many of you have ever seen The Jungle Book by Walt Disney? Okay, so here's the Jungle Book, and you've got Mowgli. It's from Rudyard Kipling, right? And you've got Mowgli, who's the boy who's lost from his parents, and he's sort of adopted by Baloo the bear and Bagheera the panther, and Shere Khan the tiger wants to kill the man-child. And a lot of adventures in the movie, but finally comes that, 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 that moment of conflict. And Blue the bear throws himself in harm's way, protects Mowgli, strike of lightning hits the tiger, he goes running off. But Bagheera and Mowgli are walking off now, and here is their dear friend, Blue the bear, whose limp body looks like he's been killed by the tiger. And as they walk off, Bagheera, the panther, says to Mowgli, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. It's very moving. Matter of fact, it's interesting. You've got, I, I, I was touring around Cluj, and you've got these statues in your, in your, uh, uh, by Liviu uh, Mokan, in, in, in the heart of your town, where during the revolution, there were martyrs who were killed. And if you go there, I, I was actually here several times during the bad days. The difficult days. I saw what things were like. My heart broke for the Romanian people. But anyway, I wanted to see those statues, and right next to them are the names of the martyrs, and right below is the same thing that Bagheera the Panther said to, to uh, Mowgli. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Very moving. But I'm thinking to myself, that just does not sound like Rudyard Kipling to me. So I blew the dust off of my uh, Just So stories and my Jungle Book stories, and I couldn't find it anywhere. It actually comes from the Bible, a verse in the Bible in John chapter 15. But the idea was, here was somebody who, who was giving up his life for another person. How did that end up in a Walt Disney movie? Many years later, I was asked to go and give a lecture to all the Walt Disney artists 
they would come in this big tiered auditorium and they would give each of the artists a box lunch. And I was to give a 45 minute lecture on Tolkien and Lewis and their vision of story. Uh, they said, we knew that they, had people, they were people of faith, but we don't want you to talk so much about faith unless it enters into the importance of their story, because it was important to these two men. You can't really talk about them without talking about their faith to a degree. But they said, but if our artists ask you any questions, you can answer the questions freely. So I gave the lecture, and after the lecture, the first question was, well, weren't Lewis and Tolkien Christians? Could you tell us about that? I was surprised that was the question. The next question, isn't Aslan the lion in the Narnian Chronicles a Christ figure? Could you tell us about that? The next question was, well, when Gandalf fights and saves his friends against the Balrog and he dies as Gandalf the Grey and comes back Gandalf the White, isn't that kind of a Christ figure in the Tolkien books? Are there other Christ figures in Tolkien? And all of a sudden, all the questions were along this theme. I couldn't believe it. So the artists end up going back to work, and about 20 of the artists come up to me, and they said to me, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. And I noticed that they were the ones that had asked all the questions. I said, are you? They said, of course. Why do you think we were asking you those questions? <laughs> and I said, well, I have a question for you. How did greater love hath no man than this that he lay down his life for a friend getting a Disney movie? He said, oh, we've been sneaking things in those movies for years. But they also said other people have been sneaking other things in as well. But there's something about these stories. And Lewis was interested in it before he was ever a Christian, and Tolkien was utterly fascinated by it. And they would talk about these things. I, I, I think it's interesting because um, all kinds of people are interested in this story of somebody coming and laying down their life to rescue somebody else. Uh, you, 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 you'll, you'll pick it up. Um, James Cameron, do you know who he is? The, the producer, uh, movie director and stuff. I have never heard him interviewed where he doesn't, somewhere in the interview, just trash Christians, say horrible things about Christians. And I don't understand what it is, why he's obsessively upset at us. But every time he makes a movie, have you noticed he always uses the story, the Christian story? Why? He does Terminator 2. An alien from a distant land comes and lays down his life to save the woman and the child. You've got Titanic. He spent more money than had ever been made on a movie. $200 million to make this movie. His investors have his head on the block. It better be a success. And actually, it's the first movie that ever made more than a billion dollars. So he's got incredible sets. He's got a, a set a quarter the size of the original Titanic. He's got big box office draws. Uh, so, um, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kate Winslet. He's got Celine Dion and her ascendancy doing the music. He's got incredible special effects, but he still has to tell a story. What story does he tell? He tells our story. You see, there's this guy named Jack. He's poor. He wins in a card game a ticket to the uh, doomed ship. He goes immediately to the bow of the ship, makes the shape of the cross, and says, I'm king of the world. There's a woman on that ship who, because her father has died and left the family penniless, her mother has pushed her into a marriage she does not want to marry a guy who's wealthy, but he's, he's like the devil incarnate. And they're on the doomed ship, and the girl sees no hope for herself. She goes to the stern of the ship, and she's going to throw herself off and take her life. And Jack just happens to be there and saves her life. They bring the old lady now back to find out what happened the night the Titanic sank. And she tells the story and they go, we don't even have a record of that man on the boat. And she says, but isn't it interesting? He saved me in every way. And then what's the next movie that Cameron makes? Avatar. And here's this man who goes in and takes on the flesh of that world and saves that world and what does the word avatar mean? It's Sanskrit for incarnation. 
Lewis and Tolkien were interested in these kinds of stories. So is everybody. We gravitate towards them when we see them displayed in a hundred different ways. Lewis was struggling with things. And he talked to Tolkien. He had reasoned his way out of atheism. He had reasoned his way out of materialism. And finally, reasoned his way to a theistic position. But he said at that moment in his life, he didn't think he could know God personally any more than Hamlet could know Shakespeare. So Lewis and Tolkien had a long conversation. It was in early September 1931. And they were walking along this path at Oxford called Addison's Walk. You can go there to this day and walk right along. It hasn't changed since they walked along it. And while they were talking, Tolkien says to Lewis, why is it that you love this story of somebody who lays down their life to save another person, but you don't accept it at the one place where it's supposed to be fact, history? And Lewis was intrigued by that. It never dawned on him that the story he loved as myth might have actually become real. And Lewis ends up saying, in fact, if Hamlet, the character in the play, could ever get to know the author of the play, Shakespeare, the only way it could ever happen would be if Shakespeare, the author, wrote himself into the play as a character of Shakespeare and made the introduction possible. And Lewis says, I think that's what happened in the Incarnation. So it was about two weeks later, September 28, 1931, C.S. Lewis becomes a person of faith. Well, as a result of that, now he and Tolkien still have this friendship, but the friendship connects at an even deeper level. And so they started talking about wanting to write stories and encouraging each other in the writing of stories. And they wanted to write the stories they said that they liked to read. And these would be stories about transcendence and transcendence coming down into our world. And so they would read the stories as they were writing them to each other. And the stories became better because of that. Lewis said that he had, um, he, he thought that the best thing that had ever been written about fairy stories was written by Tolkien. After The Hobbit came out, Tolkien had been invited to St. Andrews University to give a lecture on fairy stories. And Lewis included it in a book called Essays Presented to Charles Williams. Charles Williams was another inkling, and Charles Williams died unexpectedly. And so they put together a book, and each of the inklings would contribute a chapter to the book. And Lewis says to Tolkien, I want you to finally publish this thing on fairy stories. So what were the stories? How did they work? And, and, and in Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, uh, he basically says all stories are basically embellishments of earlier stories. Uh, we have what he called stone soup. Did you guys hear that story when you were a child where the soldiers are coming to town and the people close the doors and go hide because they don't want to have to feed the soldiers? And one of the soldiers pulls out a stone and says he's going to make stone soup and the people are looking out through the, the shutters of their houses. What's stone soup? If we know about this, we'll never have to plow again, plant again, or harvest again. The guy throws a stone in the pot. They've got the water boiling. They're all looking in and the townspeople are looking. And one of the soldiers says, you know, the stone soup really tasted good last time when we had some onions. Boom, shutters open up. Somebody says, I've got some onions. And he comes down, they cut up the onions. They're looking in the pot. The other people in the, behind the shutters are looking more curiously. And then somebody says, oh, it was really good with ox meat. I've got ox meat. It was good with carrots. I've got carrots. Good with potato. I've got potato. Pretty soon, it's no, no longer stone soup. It's stone stew. Everybody's adding contents to this thing. And Lewis and Tolkien both said, stories have embellishments, generations. You have a story told and then retold because the author wants to embellish it in a particular way with a particular theme. We, we do it in our day today, still. Um, you've got West Side Story. What is it? It's an embellishment of Romeo and Juliet. You've got August Rush. It's an embellishment of Oliver Twist. Uh, if you've seen August Rush, the Robert Williams guy is a Fagin character. You got, oh, brother, where art thou? It's the embellishment of Homer's Odyssey. You've got uh, um, Bridget Jones' Diary. It's an embellishment of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. 
You've got clueless. It's an embellishment of Emma. You've got inception. It's an embellishment of the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. We still do this stuff today. Tolk, uh, Lewis himself did it. Uh, Lewis himself did it because he, he, he wrote The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It's kind of an odyssey. He wrote Prince Caspian. It's kind of a retelling of Hamlet, just like The Lion King was a retelling of Hamlet. Um, he, uh, Lewis wrote, uh, Till We Have Faces. It's a retelling of the myth of Cupid and Psyche. But they embellish it in a particular way. All these stories are embellishments to some degree. The fairy stories, told and retold and so on. You, you, you've heard them. What, what, how many of you have heard the story where there's a king and queen in a land and they can't have kids? And all the nation is sad for them. And then one day the queen is expecting. And everybody with great anticipation is looking forward to the birth of the child. And they give birth to a little girl. And they have all the invitations going out for the christening, but somebody's overlooked in the invitation. And consequently, that person comes and rather than giving a blessing to the child, gives a curse to the child. And the child is cursed at birth, and the only way this curse is going to be undone is if somebody comes, a prince from a distant land, to, to somehow rescue the prince, vanquish the foe, and so on. We all, we, we all know these stories. And so here it is, the, the telling, the retelling. But what are the elements of the story? Um, one of the elements, Tolkien says, is prohibition. Cinderella, you can go to the ball, but you have to be back before the clock starts, strikes 12. Pandora, you can have the box, but you can't ever open it. You open it and all kinds of problems are going to result. What was the problem? All the evils of the world rushed out at her when she opened the box and violated the prohibition. Except one thing. What was it that stayed in the box? Do you remember? It was hope. Hope. Uh, Bluebeard, your, your wife can go in any room you, she wants but one. Um, uh, all these different things that are prohibitions in the story that show us all joy is contained in obedience and all calamity is contained in stepping outside the, the boundaries. Where, where is Livio Mokan's um, uh, Ten Commandments? What, what, what is the place where that is? Sangar. Say it real loud. Sangar. Do you know where that is? Have you heard of that place? So Livio uh, Mokan built a thing of the Ten Commandments. It's a, it's a, a, a statue, like a, there's these ten posts. Inside is joy. Outside is sadness. We hear the commandments, you know, they say, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. We think, what a downer. C.S. Lewis's wife, Joy Davidman, wrote a book that Lewis wrote the introduction to. It's called Smoke on the Mountain. And it's a positive retelling of the Ten Commandments. When God says, thou shalt have no other gods before thee, he's saying, I want you, though, to have me. I want you to find fulfillment in me. When you go through all the commandments, tell the truth, um, uh, uh, do not bear false witness means what? Be a truth teller. Live in, live in a society where trust is cultivated. And all these sorts of things. You get to the last one, thou shalt not covet, which is what? Learn to be content with your life. And, and live you even illustrate it so it's like a fence. All the sad things are outside the fence. All the good things are inside. We push our nose up against the fence and we long for that which we don't even realize will hurt us rather than putting our back to the fence and seeing the playground that's defined. Well, Tolkien writes about this. He, gets, he borrows it from G.K. Chesterton who says, all positive joy exists on condition. And consequently, that's another feature of these stories. But then there's four other features. There's the concept of fantasy. And for Lewis and Tolkien, the idea of fantasy is to awaken in people a desire for another world. Um, and when they wrote stories, they sensed that the, this was a characteristic of the fairy stories. How many of you, when you were a child, had parents read to you at nighttime? And when they would read to you and you heard a good story, what did you say after you heard it? Read it again. Read it again. Why? Lewis says the good story that awakens in us a longing for the other world, though we may know all the twists and turns of the plot, 
Because we long for the world of that story, we want to return to that world, and it awakens in us a desire for another world and ultimately for the only other world we could ever really know. That's fantasy. And I, I remember my son, my oldest son, Jeremy, was in a lot of plays at Wheaton College. When he was young, the, the theater director would call up and say, could Jeremy come and audition for this play? There was one time when he played young Pip in the adaptation of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. He had the majority of the lines for the first third of the play. He was 10 years old, living the life of a college student. He was loving it. If we couldn't find him at home, we'd go up to the dorms and find him in the dorm with one of his thespian friends with the earphones on, listening and rocking out to his friend's music. This went on for two and a half months. He's loving the world. He goes through 10 performances. The last night of the last performance, I go to get him, and he is given his uniform, his costume to take home. He's so happy. And he goes walking through the theater, and he sees to his horror that the students have a tradition. They don't leave till they've torn down the set. He said, Dad, I've got to sit down. He looked like Obi-Wan Kenobi when that planet blew up and he knew there was a disturbance in the force. And he sits down and we watch for about 10 or 15 minutes. I said, Jeremy, we've got to go. And he shuffles out to the car like an old man. And we get to the car and he said, Dad, I just didn't want it to end. I said, but Jeremy, it's the nature of every play. It must come to an end. It's the nature of every holiday and every vacation. It must come to an end. It's the nature of your own childhood that one day it will come to an end. Maybe you're longing for the one thing that never has to end. And he stopped and he said, you mean heaven. You mean something transcendent, basically, something otherworldly. Tolkien and Lewis were writing to produce that effect in the people who would read their stories. That's fantasy, awakening of desire. The next area is recovery, recovery. How many of you have seen people, when they get married, they're just making eyes at each other at the altar? They, they can't get their eyes off of each other. They're so excited about the future that's ahead. Then you see them 30, 40 years later. You know, go to a restaurant. They're both sitting at the same table. The guy's got his newspaper up like the walls of Jericho or something like that. The woman's sitting on the other side and she's looking out the window and you go, what happened? What happened? There's a glory there. These two people matter. And yet somehow there needs to be some recovery. Tolkien defines it this way. Recovery is the ability to see once again with a clear view the things that have maybe been trivialized by virtue of familiarity. And we want to revivify them and give them life again and see the glory of this relationship or this particular thing. You grow up with a wood near your house, you play there, and pretty soon it's boring to you. But now you read about an enchanted wood in the story and the wood by your house takes on all of a sudden a new meaning, a new excitement, a new thrill. Let me give you an example of this idea of recovery. George MacDonald wrote a story once called The Princess and the Goblin. And in the story, he starts telling it as a narrator and he's interrupted. And I want to give it to you like he told it. I'll move from side to side so you get the picture. There once was a princess who, oh, but Mr. Author, why do you always write about princesses? Well, because every little girl is a princess. Oh, you'll make them vain if you tell them that. Not if they understand what I mean. Well, what do you mean by a princess? What do you mean by a princess? Well, I mean the daughter of a king. Very well then. Every little girl is a princess. And she would have no problems with this, except she often acts like she grew up out of the mud. And that's why little girls need stories about princesses told about them, so that they could fully realize the kind of person they are. Every little girl is a princess. 
There's something transcendent about that, but it comes down to us. And all of a sudden, we look at little girls a little, little bit differently now. This person matters. C.S. Lewis said there are no mere mortals. There are no ordinary people. And when Lewis and Tolkien would write these stories, the hope was as we read them, we would begin to look at people with an exalted view rather than trash people. There, there, there was a book, a lecture actually, given at Harvard University by a woman named uh, Judith Martin. She had an etiquette column in the, in the, syndicated in the newspapers, and she was called Miss Manners. Uh, the essay, the, the, the lecture she gave at Harvard was on etiquette. And she said, when America started, it was supposed to be an egalitarian country. In Europe, it was often you had a king, and you had the, the nobles, and you got down to the regular, normal people, and so on. And then maybe you had serfs and whatnot. And everybody knew where they were on the food chain. And so they would treat one another by virtue of where they were. You knew where you were. You treated those who were higher up on the food chain better, and you treated those below in a servile way. But Thomas Jefferson, one of the early presidents of America, thought if we're going to have an egalitarian society, we're going to have to have a new standard for etiquette. What's it going to be? And Miss Manners is giving this lecture at Harvard, and she said it didn't work out the way Jefferson thought it should. Instead, the people saying, oh, let's treat each other well. Everybody started saying, well, you're no better than I am. And everybody started treating each other like dirt. And Miss Manners is going to solve the problem. And she says, what do we do about this? And she said, well, we don't have it by hierarchy of birth. In America, you have it by other, other means. Maybe you have it by appearance. My, my wife is beautiful. She, I, I shouldn't have ever been able to marry her, but she was very nearsighted, and that helped me. She's gotten pulled over for tickets before, and the officer will say, um, uh, Claudia Root, now, is that Mrs. Root? She's been asked out by officers when they pull her over for a ticket. Do, do, do you think she ever gets a ticket? No, she doesn't get a ticket. What happens to the bald fat guy when he gets pulled over? I always get tickets. You know, we have this etiquette. You have it by virtue of education. You have it by virtue of, of money, whatever, uh, by, by fame, notoriety. But it's just another hierarchy. How do we know how to treat each other? Well, the recovery from the fairy stories teaches us every human being has dignity. Tolkien and Lewis were writing to that end. The next area is escape. In escape, if you live in a materialistic world, it's not long before you begin to say, well, if I'm just matter, if I'm just a bunch of atoms bouncing around and stuff like that, then, then, then you know, what's really the meaning of life? And the escape in these fairy stories was to help people see they were more than mere matter. And so Lewis, or Tolkien, both Lewis and Tolkien write about this, that the escape in literature is not escapist. I'm running from my frustrating life to this world of wish fulfillment. No, they said it's not the escape of the deserter. Tolkien said it's the escape of the prisoner. We have this feeling that maybe we've been encapsulated in a world that's not real, and we want to break out of it and understand reality better. That's escape. And the last area of the story is consolation, the joy of the happy ending. Tolkien coins a word for it. He calls it the eucatastrophe, the tragedy that comes about to the good end. That is always a unique characteristic of fairy story. And, and it's interesting to me that Lewis and Tolkien encourage each other along these ways. It was story that brought them together. It was story that became so much of their conversation. Story that caused them to encourage each other to read what one another was writing and so on. In time, like all of us, they aged. In time, Lewis would die. Eventually, Tolkien would die. There's a, an, an author, his name was, uh, um, <clears throat> um, I just forgot his name. My wife says, my mind's like lightning, one flash, then total darkness. <laughs> um, Humphrey Carpenter was his name, and the book he wrote was on the Inklings. And he said, as they aged, 
Lewis and Tolkien eventually grew further apart, and their friendship became less significant. I, I, I've read these authors. My mind is like a pickle soaking in the brine of C.S. Lewis. I know these authors. That wasn't my experience from what I'd read in their letters and in their books and so on. So I had dinner one night with John Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien's son. And I mentioned this passage in, in, in Humphrey Carpenter's book. And I said, did your dad and Lewis really grow apart at the end of their lives? He said, I read Humphrey Carpenter's book too, and I had no clue what he was talking about. He said the reality was, as Lewis was ill for the last nine months of his life, John Tolkien said, I drove my father every week to see Lewis. And every week they would engage in these deep, life-giving conversations because the friendship that started when they were young stayed with them to the end of their life. It's really cool, I think. And I think each of us needs to cultivate friends like that. Maybe we could learn from those two. I think that that's enough for now. So... Over here. What was the matter with that chair? It has a secret. It has a secret? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope you liked it. Thank you very much, Professor Thank you. Ruth, for this wonderful... Can I say a quick word how I got interested mm -hmm. in these authors? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you have to take this totally by faith right now. But when I was young, I was actually an athlete. <laughs> and I grew up in a very poor part of Los Angeles, a very rough area where the gangs started in L.A. That's where I grew up. And, and I, I didn't have grades to go to college, but I was a sportsman. So I went to play sports. And that meant I was going to keep a minimum level at my grades just to stay eligible. And, and early on in college, I had become a Christian. And, and, and I started reading, and I came upon C.S. Lewis. And I started reading him voraciously. Somehow, he wrote with such clarity, and he wrote with such imaginative depiction, that my world, which had been monochromal, black and white world, now all of a sudden got flush with color as I read and learned and the ideas came and my mind woke up and so on. And it was through Lewis I got to Tolkien. It was through Lewis I got to Homer and Plato and Aristotle and, and Thomas Aquinas and Augustine. And I got to Chaucer and Milton and Shakespeare. Lewis opens more than wardrobe doors. And I ended up getting better grades because of it. And I ended up going to graduate school. When I did my master's, I found out I had to write a, uh, a um, thesis. And there was no way I was going to write it on the use of the optative mood in the Greek text of Philemon and the Bible. But I asked them if I could maybe write on, on C.S. Lewis. And they said, yes. So I put pen to paper. It wasn't long after that that I started reading more, writing more. And then all of a sudden, I found everybody wanted to know about Lewis. I was shocked. And I've been studying him for 51 years, teaching college and university courses for 41 years, and I've lectured on him in um, 79 universities in 19 different countries, and I've got nine books that I've written on Lewis. If nobody was interested, I would still be all in. Because his works and the things that he leads me to take my breath away. And I'm fascinated. So anyway. Thank you. And now we will all run to start reading. To start? <laughs> reading. Reading. <laughs> uh, I heard that uh, we have a few questions. If yes. you would be willing to uh, answer. They're up there. Um, I think. Wow. Oh, there you go. Oh, here we go. So how did you be become passionate about C.S. Lewis? You've already answered this yeah, question. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, <laughs> and, and, and the thing is, though, he, he, he takes you other places. We, we live in a, in a very difficult age right now. Um, I have seen in the last 25 years, the work of my students has declined significantly. The intelligence of my students has not declined. They are very sharp. And we are one of the, there's like 7,000 colleges and universities in America. And our college where I teach is in the top 50. But I've seen the decline of the work of our students. Why is that? And I think it's because of distraction. We live in an age of distraction, social media and so on. I'm not saying you shouldn't engage in social media, but we're losing a sense of temperance about it. And it's just consuming our life. When I was in college, if you had to write a research paper, let's say you had to write a 10 page paper and you needed 10 sources. You'd go to the library and they had these card catalogs and you'd pull them out and you'd look through the cards and you'd find a little paragraph description of a book. You say, well, that one might help me. You go to the stacks and you get the books and you bring them back to your desk in the library and you find out five of them aren't going to help you at all. So you got to go back to the stacks and get these books. You don't Google the cover of the book. Instead, you have to read. So you look at the index and you say, well, this chapter and this chapter and this chapter look look interesting, the table of contents, you look at the index and you maybe read through three chapters and you get like three data cards out of those three chapters that you can use in your paper. Ten books that way and you get a boatload of collateral knowledge. And our students today who are getting immediate information are not getting the collateral knowledge of the wider context. And what, what I would say is don't, don't Beat yourself up if you're interested in social media, but discipline yourself so that you only allow yourself so much time each day or a place each day so that it doesn't distract you from the kind of thing where you can read and grow. And by the way, if you do, when you get together with people in social media, you'll bring more to the table. And I think that's really a good thing. So that's how I'm passionate about C.S. Lewis. Thank you. The next question is, what inspired you on a personal level from this tale of friendship? What are a few lessons you have learned from them? Yeah, I, I think like that quote I read from Owen Barfield at the very beginning, uh, that the, the sine qua non of human consciousness is relationship with other people. And as I would read about Lewis and I would read about their the, the relationship he had with Tolkien, with Owen Barfield, with Neville Coghill, with the other Inklings and so on, Charles Williams. I started realizing as I was reading them, there was a quality of life that was emerging. I wanted that quality of life. Now, I did have the benefit of playing football, American football, in university. And consequently, it gave me a subgroup that I bonded with. And again, friendship begins to develop when you share something in common with another person. So here were these relationships I had with these guys I played football with. But all of a sudden, a couple of us became Christians, and so we wanted to talk about that because we wanted to understand it better. And, and then some of us got interested in these authors, so we started doing that. I saw that as Lewis and Tolkien joined together and conversed, let their guard down a little bit, that benefited. So how's it benefited me? On Thursday nights at my house for the last 19 years, I've met with a group of guys. Some women come too, we're not, we're not gender specific in that regard. And I pour them all a thumb's width of single malt scotch, really good scotch. We smoke pipes, no cigars, no cigarettes, pipes. Uh, we, we have a rule that you can't smoke a cigar unless you can bench press 400 pounds. Because my nephew used to play football for one of the major universities. He could bench press 400 pounds. Nobody could tell him what to smoke. So anyway, we begin always with poetry. Always with poetry. And the conversations are most magnificent. C.S. Lewis's son comes to it when he's in town. Uh, many great C.S. Lewis scholars come to it when they're in town. Denise, you've been to that Pipes group before. And, and so there's something there where this conversation began. There's actually 26 
uh, daughter groups of that group worldwide because people have been there and they've gone out and started another one. Maybe you could start one here in Cluj. And we have these discussions. I, I think I picked that up from these guys. The other thing, too, is I'm in two reading groups where we write and then we read to each other what we're writing, and it helps us with our publications. And so I picked that up from them, too. So there, there's some ways. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And if you were to ask Louis a question, what would you ask him? Why didn't he like sports? <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to answer that. There's just too many things. He, I, I wouldn't want to ask him one question. I'd feel cheated. I would like to sit down and talk with him about a host of things. And here's, here's one for you. He wrote one book. There's 73 books he wrote in 11 to 17 different genres, depending on how you count them. One book he wrote, 700 pages long, is called English Literature in the 16th century, excluding drama. He did it for the Oxford History of English Literature. It took him 18 years to write it, Oxford History of English Literature. He called it his O oh Hell volume because it took so long to write. To write that book, he read every book written in English in the 16th century. Can you imagine that? He read every book translated into English in the original language it was written, old Italian, old French, Latin, whatever, and he'd read it in translation so that he could make a judgment about the, the quality of the translation that would be informed. It's one of the most prodigious books of scholarship written in the last century. And I read that book, and you laugh your head off. He's so funny, and he's so perceptive, and he's so clear, and he's so imaginative in his depictions. But he, he wrote about this one author, Michael Drayton. I'd never heard of him before. And what he said about Michael Drayton, I said, again, because Lewis opens more than wardrobe doors, I said, I've got to read Michael Drayton. I read Michael Drayton. It took my breath away. I was so interested. And Lewis has so many people like this he talks about. I'd want to sit down and ask him about all of them. What is it that attracted you to that author? What did you get out of it? And what could I get out of you that I could learn and benefit from what you've learned? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. We have just a few more minutes. If you have another question. There's one up there. Should we do uh, that one? So what do you think is one thing from the books of Lewis and Tolkien that most people don't get? I think it's that these two men were deeply spiritual men. And I think it comes through in their writing, but I think sometimes people stop at the story and don't look at what was so intriguing to them that transcended the story. So many people do get it. I think children get it quicker than adults, by the way. Mm. And what would you say are the top three Christianity-inspired characters or stories in The Lord of the Rings. Well, you've got Gandalf the Grey, who dies saving his friends, and he comes back as Gandalf the White. You've got uh, Frodo, who bears the burden of the world in order to save the world. I think that's kind of a Christ figure, too. Uh, as some, somehow, Tom Bombadil is a bit of a Christ figure. He's utterly unaffected by evil, you know. They think that maybe they could give the ring to him, but they think he would get distracted and misplace it. That wouldn't be good. But Tom Bombadil has some Christ kinds of figures in him as well. And then you've got Aragorn, the king, who comes to his own, and his own don't recognize him. And, and, and I think there's a Christ figure there at some level. So do you think that nowadays friendships are less significant or less deep because of the technology and the fast-paced life we live? Well, I think I mentioned that already. We can get distracted by social media. I don't think that that is because of the culture. I think it's a result of the choice of each individual. If you want that kind of friendship, you can have it. But there's a sacrifice you're going to have to make for it. And the sacrifice is really a relatively small sacrifice. You give up this 
to have real engagement with a real person and a real friendship with a real person. And I'm not telling you to give up your social media. I, I, I don't think you have to, but I do think you have to build margins. You have to build boundaries. And if you value friendship, it, it will also mean this too. You'll have to let down your guard somewhere. And there's a risk in that. It's, it's tough. I remember one time I felt like, okay, I'm struggling with this area. I need a friend. And so I decided I was getting to know this guy. I would let down my guard and share it with him. And I shared it, this struggle I had with him. It was no more than five or ten minutes later he was already telling somebody else. And it was so disappointing to me that I said, okay, the goal of life is never share deep stuff with anybody. But what I was really doing is letting that one guy who was not a kind person have control over my future. I didn't want to do that. And I realized I, I, I needed to talk with him and say what you did was inappropriate. I even trusted him again, and he did it again. And I just said, okay, whenever I meet that guy, we'll talk about the weather. <laughs> but I couldn't let that guy keep me from having those relationships. And so there was another guy. I let down my guard with him, and he proved true. And then there was another guy, and I let down my guard with him, and he proved true. And I have a handful of such deep, life-giving friendships, but it was willing to take the risk to let down my guard and not let the people who were abusive have control. Mm -hmm. So we make decisions for this. Does that make sense? Yes. So what C.S. Lewis book would you give to an, uh, an agnostic or atheist friend? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, my college roommate, we're, we're very close. And uh, we, 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 we both played football together. He was the captain of the team. He still holds school records at my school. We're very close. And <clears throat> this summer, he said, come out and visit me. And we camped at Half Moon Bay, which is just below San Francisco. And we had e-bikes. Do you guys know those? They have these little batteries in them and stuff. Those are great bikes. And we're riding along the cliffs four hours a day for a week. And then the rest of the day, we would talk and so on. And, and, and we used to, um, when we were in college, neither of us dated very much in college. So instead, we would go for rides in his MGA. It was a little sports car convertible along the Pacific Coast Highway. And we would smoke cigars and talk about what life would have been like if we did date. And now on Zoom, we call each other every week and we have a conversation for the length of a Churchill cigar. And when it's gone, the conversation's over till next week. So anyway, he and I were riding along the cliffs below San Francisco. And he said, there's this one place you have to see. It was an outcropping of the cliff. You could see the waves breaking on the rocks below. It was just glorious. And we're looking at it and admiring it, looking out of the sea. And sure enough, this couple comes up. And they're looking at it, and we're talking with them about how beautiful it is. And I said to them, isn't it great to have somebody to thank for this? And this guy, all of a sudden, who's been enjoying the conversation, gets real, you know, abrupt. And he says, I'm an atheist. And I said, I'll bet I can prove to you in 10 minutes you're not. And I basically encapsulated Lewis's own arguments towards how he moved from atheism to faith. And the guy looks at me after 10 minutes and said, you're right, I'm an agnostic. And so then I said, you might want to read a book by C.S. Lewis. And I sent him a book called Mere Christianity. And I didn't even put my return address on the book, but somehow he found me and I got a text from him. And he says, I'm reading the book, it's really helpful. So I think Mere Christianity, if the person, you know, there you go. So what are your favorite books of Lewis and Tolkien? Maybe a top three for each? Okay, it's really hard. When somebody says to me, what's your favorite C.S. Lewis book? I say, whichever one I'm reading at that moment. <laughs> but I think it, with Tolkien, it's a little bit easier for me. Um, I, of course, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, so that's two. We'll count that as two. But I don't, and, and his essay on fairy stories is wonderful. But I don't know if you've ever read uh, Leaf by Niggle. Leaf by Niggle. Usually you can buy Leaf by Niggle and his essay on fairy stories as a single book. I love it. There's another one called Farmer Giles of Ham. I love that book. So that's Tolkien. For, for Lewis, um, 
it, it, it's, it's almost uh, which genre, which genre. If you were going to say um, his literary criticism, I would say The Discarded Image, his book on the medieval worldview. They were lectures he gave at Oxford every three years for 29 years. And it was his understanding of a foundation for medieval literature. And it's, it's breathtaking. He calls it the discarded image because he recognizes every generation will have a way of looking at the world, a worldview, but it will have to give way to more robust understanding as we learn and grow. It's a very good book. Um, if it was his Narnian books, I think The Voyage of the Dawn Treader for me is my favorite. If it's his novels generally, Till We Have Faces, the retelling of the story of Cupid and Psyche. Um, if it was his, uh, his um, more devotional kinds of books, there's a book he wrote just before he died called Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer. And I have taken great inspiration from that book. Mm. So anyway, those, those would probably be the basic ones. It looks like that's it. Okay, I will add one personal question. Yes. Let's say. I know that you've been... Wait a minute. Do you realize she's going to ask me a personal question? <laughs> okay. I know you've been to so many countries. Yeah. But I also know that you came to Romania even before 89, yeah. risking your life. 88 and 89, both yes, those years. Yes, and uh, you was probably the first one who talked about Lewis back then. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I was giving lectures We'll have on to Lewis. do some research. Um, and you have come twice to the C.S. Lewis conference in Yash, and uh, this time you were ready to travel around uh, the country to give lectures like this. Uh, why is it that you love Romania? What is that? What? Why do you love Romania? I fell in love with Romania by falling in love with the people. I was hassled once by this. I was hassled once by the secret police during the Ceausescu days for six to eight hours. And I knew I could leave. But people here had to stay. And they lived in that. I, I met some people who obviously were bitter and cantankerous. But my experience was meeting people who even under that oppression had developed a kindness, a concern for others. And I was impressed with, their, with the people. And then this has continued over the years as I've come back. I like the beauty of, this, of, of the country. I've been all over, you know, in both East and West, and, and Denise has been kind enough to take me up to the painted monasteries. It's interesting. I had a friend who was in Brasov. I love the mountains up there. I even went to Dracula's castle. What does that mean, right? Um, so, so all of that. But I think the thing that I've been overly impressed with are the people of Romania. That the general, I mean, you can always, no matter what country you go to, you can find the jerk who's out there, right? But, but it's been overwhelming to me that the quality of the people I've run into over and over again, there's a kindness, there's a courtesy, there's a willingness to say, your husband is the best example of it. I mean, every time I think I have something I need, he's there meeting the need before I even sense to ask it because he's perceptive, he sees. But I've seen this with his son, his sons and his daughter. Where is she? She's always protecting my backside. Where is Sarah? Anyway, there you go. So his, the kids, their kids are the same. The other thing, too, that attracts me is you. She is the first person in Romania to do a doctoral thesis on C.S. Lewis. And not only that. <laughs> and, and the university at Yash is the first university in Romania. And she has set up a conference there that's it's drawing all kinds of international attention. And people are coming, and consequently, more people are being exposed to these authors. And as a result of that, I think some of their life is being lifted up and elevated. I, I like that, too. Mm -hmm. I hope it's okay for me to say. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't expect to say that, but yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Not only that, she knows enough about Lewis that she could say to me, I don't know if you've got that right, Jerry. <laughs> That's good, too. Um, well, thank you very much. We love you, too. Thank and you. we hope that you will come back. And I hope that at least a drop of your passion 
uh, has been poured into our, into our souls and that we will really, really want to read C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and some other authors. May I say one last word about mm -hmm. that? So when I got ready to graduate from college, this guy said to me, you don't get an education in college. You lay a foundation for an education. And in America, we call the graduation ceremony commencement, which means now you will commence your education by building on that foundation. And this man said to me, pick an author who will take, him, take you places and make him your life study. I don't think it has to be an author. It could be a composer. It could be an artist. It could be a period of history. It could be a country. But what are you doing in your life to stay engaged intellectually? What are you doing to motivate yourself to grow in, in developing interests? And everything you study, it, 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 it leads to other things. So I read Lewis. Lewis would write about Evelyn Underhill. I read Evelyn Underhill. She would write about medieval mystics. I read the medieval mystics. Everything emerges and goes further. You read Tolkien, and you not only need to read Tolkien, eventually you have to read the Icelandic myths. And you read uh, G.K. Chesterton, and you've got to read the books that he'll take you to as well. And, and you find out at the end of the day, uh, uh, maybe at the end of your life when you're my age, uh, the archaeology department at my college says they have shelf space for me to be displayed now. But it, it, towards the end of your life, you start to say, it's really been a great ride. It's been a blast. And I don't think you're going to be able to say that if you haven't stayed engaged. Life has enough disappointments. What's going to help you transcend the disappointments and see with a wider eye and a deeper interest and an ever-growing hunger and thirst for knowledge with its, all of its delights that come with it? So I think that, that that's what I would say, too. Thank you very much again. Okay.